Hello and welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. It's me, Mark, and I'm joined again by Richard. How are you tonight, Richard? Very well, thanks. Not bad at all. A bit disappointed about the weather. Seems to have gone a little bit, um, not as good as it was, but you forget where we live. Um, but, you know, not too bad at all. Busy, busy, lots going on, which is always good. About yourself, mate? Ah, yeah, busy as ever. We're a little bit more grateful than you that the temperatures have dropped because it's horrible <laughs> upon roofs when it's roasting. I'm not going to lie. So that's been a nice change for a bit of fresher weather. We were supposed to be joined by um, Craig and Jamie was going to pop in tonight as well, but they both got stuck with work. So me and Richard are going to plow on with this. We have got another example in this design series we're putting together. Richard's kindly put this forward. He's going to take us through it and it's um, based loosely around what we said last time. So we're looking at a shower circuit, aren't we, Richard? Yeah, just a you know typical scenario. Um, based on a, a fixed piece of equipment um, you just have a little flick through the stages bit by bit referencing various uh, page numbers um, and tables in the regs and also the on-site guide try to do a bit of both I generally use the regs but I understand that the on-site guide's you know a bit more simpler to follow but some of the stuff isn't in the on-site guide hence why it's in the regs but if you can follow both then um, that's no real problem um, I don't know whether you'll make the will you make the PDFs available to people if they want to mark. I will, yeah. So it's what I'm yeah. going to do with this podcast. I'll create a specific page on the Apprentice One to One website, and I'll drop all the files in there. I've also had a go at trying to make this a bit more visually enjoying, and I'm going to um, share some images through the course of this podcast that relate to the discussion. But I realise most people are listening. So as Richard said, if you want to refer back to those later, I'll drop the link where you can go off and dig into all that at your leisure. Days. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start this um, collaboration now. For anyone who uses Zoom, I'm using Padlet, so it's a, an interesting add-on that you can get. And this should have shrunk me and Richard down now. For those of you who are watching, and we can see the scenario that we've got to look at. So what we faced with here, Richard? So yeah, Mrs. Smith. Um, she lives in a lovely old Victorian house. Anybody that's worked in a Victorian house will know that they've got very tall ceilings and they're generally quite long from front to back, which might explain the uh, length of our circuit a bit later on. But um, she's been to uh, she's been to Screwfix and she's bought herself a, a brand new Triton T80 uh, electric shower. So I've included a bit of uh, information from the manufacturer's instructions um, from the shower. So it tells us that it's a 10 and a half kilowatt, single phase um, and a bit uh, other information regarding um, some electrical um, items that you've got to consider. Talks about an isolator. Um, talks about that it must um, be protected by a 30 milliamp RCD, et cetera, et cetera. We've also got a bit more information regarding um, some details of the existing consumer unit. So it's a Hager 14 way uh, VM144. It's just a 100 amp main switch um, metal uh, consumer unit. So no RCDs or anything just a 100 amp main switch, so I need to consider that. Gives us the cable type that it wants us to use. It's obviously a domestic dwelling, so it's a 70 degree thermoplastic insulated and sheathed flat cable with a protective conductor. So the sparks among us, a bit of flat twin and CPC cable. Bit of information on the circuit installation details. So the circuit then is to be installed under the floors, so obviously through the joists, and then it's gonna enter the loft via a bit of surface PVC mini trunking in the cupboard. The circuit though will, will be grouped with one other circuit inside that mini trunk in before it enters the loft where the cable will be covered with 90 mil of thermal insulation. So there's 90 mil of rock wall, which you get in generally most people's lofts. So there's a bit of rock wall in there. So there's some considerations to make there. It talks about the uh, highest ambient temperature we're gonna um, get to is 30 degrees C. Our circuit length is 78 meters. So it's a long it's run this run. time, but... <laughs> I've rewired a few Victorian houses back in my day, um, and it's not uncommon to install a circuit of that length. Our supply uh, characteristics, it's a TNCS system, so a PME system, and we've got a value there of uh, 0.14 ohms for our external uh, fault loop impedance. So nice. straight away... I'm going to close that that down because you've sent yep. um, something that I should probably share first, yep. the key so information. That's it. What I've tried to do is which I used to do um, back in my teaching days, you, you, you never leave the industry, it's still in your brain, is to visualize some of those uh, important items um, and considerations we need to make from, from the spec, really. 
So the house type we know is an old Victorian. So no one's ever worked on a Victorian house as an example of one there. Earthing system, again, TNCS, PMA. Picture of the, the DB that's installed. It's a Hager VM1114. Cable type is flat twin. Circuit length we know is 78 meters. Highest ambient temperature. And ambient temperature is the temperature around us, 30 degrees C. Uh, image of some cables passing through uh, the joist under a floor. And then another image of um, some cables running inside some PVC mini trunking. And then you've got uh, a picture of some cables, generally the installation method that we'll find in a loft where we've got some um, rock wall, fiberglass, everyone's Sparks favorite to uh, loft yeah. height. So, you know, sometimes when you look at a spec, if you can simplify it out and visualize it out a bit, get all the key bits of information, certainly with cable calculations and design, if you've got that information, you've only really got to put it into a step-by-step -step process to get where you want to get, if that kind of makes sense. And if you follow that process, it makes it a bit more simple. That does make sense. And some of these questions that you get asked at a kind of exam level, they are quite wordy, aren't they? So trying to yeah. Yeah. visualize it, as you've said, and pull out the bits of key information. It's how you'd approach it on site, isn't it? You're looking yeah. at things and you're kind that's of it. gauging how stuff works. So you're trying to pull out a paper, bring it into the real world, and that's a really clear demonstration of what we're faced with there so we've got yeah. our ze quite a long cable run and um, yeah. we've got a bit of grouping and some insulation yeah. to deal with are the things that are jumping out at me on that one so um should we should we move on to page one are we going to put these yeah. slides up as we work through them to discuss yeah, it right. yeah. yeah so this is um the first yeah. series of data that um richard can take us through yeah so all i've tried to do is break um break it down into, into the various steps in order to achieve compliance ultimately with, with the regs. There's a little bit of a curveball thrown in and a couple of questions asked as we're going along. Um, so last week when we had a look at Craig's example, we looked, first of all, we looked at diversity and whether we can apply it. So I've considered that within uh, this example. So if we calculate our design current, first of all, uh, and our design current, we can calculate quite simply from our old triangle PIV. So we're going to divide the power by the voltage. Uh, and if we've got any power factor issues, then we can apply that. But it's a single phase uh, resistive load. So we don't have any power factors to consider. So quite simply, 10 and a half, kilowatt, uh, 10 and a half uh, kilowatts, which is obviously 10,500 watts. Divide that via nominal voltage, uh, which is 230 volts. So for this... 10 and a half kilowatt shower, we've actually got a design current of 45.65 amps, so around about 46 amps. So it's going to pull quite a lot of juice when it's on. So we can ask then, can we apply diversity to this shower? Are we allowed to? Is it a good idea? Well, if we look in the on-site guide uh, within table A2 on page 137, it gives us um, a bit of um, guidance on uh, how we can apply diversity. Um, and that's kind of based on the type of premises, first of all, and the load. Um, and it gives us some information as to what we can and what we can't do. Ultimately, it is the choice of the designer, but we're going to follow the on-site guide because if you think about it, this shower is a, in, uh, is a thermostatically controlled water here. That's what it does. So yeah. if you look in table A2, it is an individual household and we're not allowed any diversity. We're not allowed to have diversity. It's going to pull 45.65 amps as soon as you switch it on. Simple as that. And so, that's page, that question, page 137, is it, at the on-site guide for those who are listening? Yeah, page 137. Yeah. Yeah. Table later. Again, all the pages and things are in the PDF, so you can go and find those. So, no, simple answer to that. Can we apply diversity? Can we save ourselves a few, a few quid? No, we can't. So we've got to nice. go, yeah, 45.65 amps, 10 and a half kilowatts. It's going to be nice and warm. All right, so now we've established the design current then of 45.65 amps. We can think about the next stage in our cable cut, and we need to determine the rating and type of overcurrent device. And we've also got to consider additional protection if required. So we already know that from the manufacturer's instructions, it states that it, it must be protected by 30 milliamp RC. But we need to look at the regs as well and see what the regs say if we need to consider it. So before we start the cable cut, we've got to think about 
regulation 433.1.1 um, in the uh, regs, and it talks about overload protection. And it gives us a formula, IN should be equal to, um, or greater than IB, which should be equal to, or greater than IZ, et cetera, et cetera. So we've calculated our design current. The next thing we need to do then is to consider uh, the rating of our device and the type of our device. So within the regs, page 243 and the on-site on on guide, page 87, um, we've got some information regarding this type of installation and where this uh, piece of equipment is going to be installed. So because it's going to be installed in a room containing a bath or a shower, we've got to consider reg regulation 701.411.3.3, and it is a requirement um, that it is pr uh, protected with uh, additional protection by a 30 milliamp RCD. So the board, the Hager board, is just a 100 amp main switch board. So the best solution to get around this, there is no RCDs in it, we need an RCD. We also need to think about overcurrent protection. So we're gonna go with an RCBA. And we've got Makes a picture sense. of the, the suitable device there. They still make this device, which is good. It is made by the same brand and it is compatible with that consumer unit. Happy days. The full protection side of this RCBO then, in, in effect the MCB part, we're gonna go with the type B because we've got no inrush current to consider. It's just a purely resistive load. It's 45 amps as soon as you switch it on. Last week, we had a bit of a look at applications of circuit breakers type B, C and D. And we can find that in the on-site guide table, 7.2.7 uh, indent II on page 90. And that gives us a bit of information whether we need to consider a B, a C or a D. So because it's a standard circuit, standard load, a type B will suffice. So I've covered the part of the RCBO now for overcurrent protection. I know that I need a 30 milliamp device for additional protection. So the RCD part of this RCBO, I've got to consider what type I need. So does it need to be a type A, a B, an F, or can it be a type AC? Well, when we look in the regs again, it talks about whether it's known um, if the um, piece of equipment um, can introduce DC. Well, because it's a purely resistive load, it doesn't have no DC components. So therefore we can use a type AC and the symbol is your sinusoidal waveform. Of course, moving forward, is it a good idea to install, uh, install type AC RCDs or RCBOs? No, unless it's known that the piece of equipment that you're supplying doesn't produce any DC and this one doesn't, there's no electronics in it. So therefore it can be on a type AC. Would I install an AC? Probably not for the cost. I'd probably put a type A, about you, Mark? Yeah, Just I think most, most, most wholesalers have kind of moved away from stocking ACs on the shelf anyway now. Yeah. So you're getting type A's by default, whether you, whether you like it or not. Um, we're more likely to see them pulling Bs onto the shelf rather than ACs, I think. So yeah, yeah it would most most likely be receiving a type A, but it is important to note that you know this is one of the examples where you could use a type AC and they are becoming more limited as time moves along. So important yeah. to make that point. That's it. So then we're going to go with a 50 amp type B for the MCB side of the RCBO and a type AC for the RCD part, and of course 30 milliamps. So we're going to select then a BSCN 61009-1, which is the product standard for an RCBO, type B 50 amp. So when we look back at the formula, I need to make sure that I've got a protected device that is equal to or greater than um, my design current. So I couldn't choose a 45 amp uh, circuit breaker or RCBO in this case, because it's, it's, it's less than. So the next size up is going to be a 50 amp, and again, to refresh our memory, I can go into table 41.3 of the regs on page 68, or I could use table B6 of the on-site guide. Although that gives us maximum ZS values, it also lists um, all the different ratings of our uh, RCBOs and MCBs. And that's a nice table to go and find when you're looking for a rating of our protective device. So we've got a 45.65 amp design current, and we've got a 50 amp protected device. Happy days. Makes sense, so far to me. Makes sense so far to me. I was going to say, I think I've got some of those regs open. Is the RCDs the page four? Uh, on the left there. That one there, that's it. So that's out the regs yet. And we can look there at our type B circuit breakers to 610, uh, 60898 and RCBO 61009-1. And across the top, 
three, six, 10, 16, 20, 25. They don't actually make one in 45. Well, they, they might do. I think Hager do actually. Yeah, they do. Put it in their catalogue, but we've got to go 50 amps there because it's got to be equal to or greater than our design current, which was 45 amps. Happy days. I've been in the wrong pages there, so I do apologise. We'll go back to <laughs> page two of the example. So we've now got our, our 50 amp type B RCBO, and we're trying to look after that 45, 46 amps of current we've got flowing That's through it. the circuit. And we're now looking at the yeah. cable reference method yeah. and some so, of the factors that might apply around that. That's it. So the next stage is we've got to consider what the installation method of our cable is going to be. And when we had the initial information on the spec and the design considerations, most of the cable route is going to be through the joists as it normally would in a house. There's going to be a section where it's going to come up in some plastic mini trunking in a cupboard with one other circuit. And then in the loft, it's going to be um, going alongside some insulation, um, not greater than 90 mil. So we've got three different reference methods to consider. And we can find our reference methods uh, in the regs in table 4A2, page 437. But a, a more simplified version of that we can find in table 7.1 in DENT IV uh, in the on-site guide on page 85. So under the floors, generally reference method C, inside trunking, reference method B, and inside the loft, we're looking at reference method 100. Uh, so there is a couple of images there um, within the PDF, and you can go again to those tables and have a bit of a look. So reference method 100 is where you've got your cable installed, where it's touching either a joist or the, the plasterboard on one side, but the rest of it is covered with no more than 100 mil of thermal insulation. So we've got an example of that there. And what you've got to consider here is, although we've got three different reference methods, which one of those reference methods is going to have the most detrimental effect on the ability for the cable to dissipate heat. So if you think about it, the old rock wall, the thermal insulation there, it's a bit like wearing a Canada goose coat or a North Face coat in the summer. You cannot get rid of the heat and cables don't like heat. The more heat, the worse the current carrying capacity of that cable is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply the worst case um, reference method. In other words, a reference method that's gonna have the worst detrimental effect on the cable. So we're going to use reference method 100 then. So that's important when we select a cable in a bit. So reference method 100, we've got that. So what derating factors have we got to consider? Again, back to the spec and back to the design uh, considerations. We've got an ambient temperature of 30 degrees maximum. So in order to find out if that's going to be an issue, I need to go to the table in appendix four of the regs, table 4B1 on page 441 that I looks at... That. Let's yeah. have a look, see if I can open that up. Appendix it four. Looks at, um, ambient temperatures. So that the, that's the one, is it? No. No. So that tells us where the um, the table is. So you're on page. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. No, I don't think you've got it. No, I've not got it in there. So yeah. carry it's on. It's, it's okay. It's also in the on site guide. And when we have a look at that table, so I'll do it in the on site guide for a minute. Just so I've got it in front of me, talk you through it. So, so for those got, listening, that's page 168, appendix F. That's it, 168. And of course, with all the tables in the regs and the on-site guide, you do need to have your, your key information to be able to use the table. So the column on the left-hand side looks at the ambient temperature. What I need to do then is select the ambient temperature, so 30 degrees, and then I need to go across to the right, um, but it's based upon the insulation the, the uh, temperature rate of the insulation of the conductor that we're going to be using. So we're only using 70 degree thermoplastic flat twin uh, and CPC cable. So 30 degree ambient temperature, we go across to 70 degree thermoplastic and it gives us a rating factor of one. So happy days. So as we get a rating, value, a rating yeah. factor of one essentially oh. means there's no de rating, oh. doesn't it? So generally 30 degrees is, is the normal expected uh, ambient temperature anyway. So one, I ain't got to worry about that. I've got to consider though, that in that trunking, this cable is going to be grouped or together with another cable. So is this going to have an effect on the current carrying capacity of our new cable? Well, I need to go to uh, table 4C1 in the regs or in the on-site guide, it's table F3 on page 170. 
So I can have a look on this table. Okay. So when we look at this table, you've got how the cables are arranged on the left. So are they in air? Are they uh, on a surface embedded or enclosed, single layer on the floor, et cetera, et cetera. Number of circuits along the top that are going to be together, one, two, three, four, et cetera. And the reference method on the far right-hand side. So our two cables are going to be um, a bunch of air on surface embedded or enclosed. Well, they're going to be enclosed in that trunk in, in the landing cupboard. So how many circuits do I have all together? So I've got my new circuit plus that other circuit that's already in the trunk in. So I've got two all together and it is reference method 101, as we said. So it will be in the trunk in, should I say. So we're going to be using a, a correction factor of 0 0.80. So there is a bit of a derating factor there, there poten potentially because of the grouping. Potentially. potentially. There is a, another caveat to that maybe a little later on. <laughs> there is. So, so I've, um, got, I've got two factors so far. So we've got a couple of factors on there. One we're kind of ruling out because of the temperature yeah. and the other one we're keeping in there for the minute yeah. to do with the grouping. Brilliant. And then we jump on to the next page. Okay. So again, um, this is broken down. In appendix four of the regs, it gives us some information on page 425, but also a more simplified um, version, which we looked at last week with Craig, is in appendix F in the on-site guide on page 167. So, so far, we've worked out our design current and we've worked out um, our protected device, the rating of that. So the next thing I need to consider then is I need to consider how much current that my cable that I'm going to select is going to need to be able to carry based on this grouping with this other circuit. So to calculate IZ, we need to divide the rating of our protected device, IM, divide it by uh, any correction factors that we've got. So it'd be 50 amps, which is the rating of our protected device, divided by our 0 0.8, which is our correction factor for grouping. That comes to 62 and a half amps. It's quite so now, the current, isn't it? We're getting up there. Mm, so we've gone from 45 or so amps, our design current, but now because I've got this cable that's grouped with it, it now needs to be able to carry 62.5 amps. So I now need to go and find out a cable size that can carry this amount of current based on the reference method 100, because it's going to be in contact on one side with either the plasterboard or a joist and the thermal insulation, which is going to heat it up. Nice and simple. So what we need to do now is we need to go to our current carrying capacity tables. So I can either do this in the regs in appendix four. Uh, you can page. find that on table 4D5. And we can find it in the on-site guide. And that is going to be on page 177, table F6. Why so our current carrying capacity tables. So I'll use the on-site guide, but it's just exactly the same as the regs. The first thing you've got to consider, like we said last week, is you've got the right table for the right cable. So simple as that. So this table F6 uh, is 70 degree thermoplastic PVC insulated in sheath flat cable with a protective conductor. So I'm on the right table. What I've then got to do is find the reference method for this installation of this cable. So we've already said it's going to be reference method 100. So this table then is broken down into columns. So column one, gives me all the cross-sectional area uh, sizes of all the conductors. Column two is reference method 100, three, 101, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna go reference method 100, column two, and I'll go down until I come to at least 62.5 amps. Oh, I've got a problem now. <laughs> mm, 16 now, which is the biggest cross-sectional area, biggest size they do in flat twin uh, sure cable. Is. That reference method 100, the way it's installed, can only carry 57 amps. So we're underneath amps. that current, aren't we? Which is making that a, a no no. Yeah. Mm. So that's, that's not good. So, got a problem. Can't use 16 mil. So, I might not be able to use this type of cable. So, possible solutions there. So, what could we do? I could change the cable type and increase the CSA or see if it, you know, it affects the current carrying capacity. So maybe chuck in a bit of uh, 25 mil SWA to your shower. Everyone will love a nice rotary isolator. 28 meters, that's a bit expensive, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to load that off the back of the lorry in there. 
But 16 mil in that reference method with, those, with that correction factor, it ain't gonna be big enough. But, but have we overlooked something? Hmm. So this isn't in the on-site guide, but it is a consideration to make. So within appendix four of the regs, it gives us the relevant formula and a step-by-step -step guide on how to calculate uh, current carrying capacity and how to select the right cable. There is a little caveat in there that talks about an alternative formula and an alternative method that we can still calculate the right size cable. So it says, alternatively, you can calculate IZ then from the following formula, provided the circuits of the group are not liable to simultaneous overload. So you'll notice that the formula now is not IN over the correction factors, which is the rating of the protected device. It's the design current. So what you've got to think of is this shower that we're installing, can it ever overload? If it's design current, it's 45 amps. Can it ever draw more than 45 amps? It can't. Oh, hey. can, it can, never overload. It can never overload. We'll assume that the cable that's in the trunk in for this, I suppose I should have put it in, but it's a good conversation to have, is purely for the lighting circuit in that loft. So maybe three or four lights, all LED, no load. Very rarely on and off as well. Very rarely. Well, Very mainly. Rarely. Never going to overload. <laughs> Very rarely. Unless you've got some of those um, big LED lights you were talking about today in there. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a grow hive going on up there. You never know. Uh, so what I can do is recalculate this now, but I'm going to base it upon the design current. So instead of dividing my 0 0.8, which is my correct factor for grouping, into 50 amps, I'm now going to divide it into the design current, which was 45.65 amps. So consequently now, I need a cable that can carry 57 amps instead of 62 and a half amps. So I can go back to my current carrying capacity table, table F6, still reference method 100, because the installation method, the way it's run, is still the same. 16 mil can take 57 amps. So I need a cable that can carry 57 amps. So I'm happy, just about, that that 16 mil is big enough based upon the design current and no simultaneous overload. So therefore, yeah. Therefore, it's interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Yeah. Well, a little bit of a curveball, but there you go. 16 mil is plenty big enough. Yeah, so it's, I, like, uh, it's like you rigged up that example uh, on purpose. <laughs> on this, but it is an important example because it does show how these things can play out with the maths. Because potentially, if you'd have used the formula that's in the on-site guide and the formula that most people use based on IN, you're going to be in a whole world of trouble there. Because... Mm. You're either going to be putting 16 mil and taking no notice, and would it ever cause a problem? Probably not. Or you might go to the other extreme and having to put in 25 mil SWA or something else, you know, if you're going to do it by the book. So you've got to consider it. If you can't overload, then this is a perfect example of using the regs as opposed to the on site guide to get to the same solution. Yeah, I so, think the, on, the on site guide keeps you on the side of, of safety, doesn't it? I think. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Guidance. It's good. I mean, it, it, in this example, it's going to make the job very difficult for you, but it's um, keeping well, you safe electrically, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's just the issue of getting the 25 mil into an isolator and then into the shower that's going to be the troublesome aspect. Well, there you go. But, you know, as, as, a, as an example, it's, it's, it, it, it's a perfect it's a good example. It's a really good example. So and it also it gets, us, gets us thinking about grouping as well, it isn't it? Because it, yeah. it's often we just see in the number of cables in a bit of trunk in our containment and we just yeah. add them up and jump to the tables when really are they all under load for the required time no. and are they needing to be part of that calculation? If not, don't put them in there. It's, it's well, important. yeah, we'll talk about that at the end. That's a question for people to come back with us and give some feedback and see what they think. But 16 mil, we're happy with that. So we've done... Four, three parts, four parts of a, of a cable cut. We've selected the cable now based upon the design current and any correction factors and the way it's been installed. So we're okay with 16 mil twin, not a problem with that. So we're happy with that. Next thing we need to do then is verify that the volt drop on that cable is going to be within the maximum permitted either by the manufacturer of the equipment. So that would be Triton because it will have a voltage range. It's going to it's got to be between to make sure that it works as it should and it don't impair the safety of the people using it. Or if we don't have that information, we can go with the regs. So we'll go with the regs and see what the regs say. So we can find all this information um, on volt drop uh, within Appendix 4 
um, of the regs, page 428, and table 4AB on page 430. But we can also find some good information where we looked last week with Craig in the on-site guide appendix F, page 168. So I'll stick with the, um, the on-site guide. So when we look at page 168, it actually gives us the formula to calculate bulk drop. It doesn't do that in the regs. It gives, it, it gives us it in, in words, basically, and you have to extract the information out of the words to make the formula. So in the, in the on-site guide, nice and clear, top of page 168 gives us a formula. So to calculate volt drop, we're going to need to know our millivolts per meter for the cable that we've selected. We're going to times that by our design current, and we're going to times that by our length. So the value is in millivolts per amp per meter. We don't want that. We want the volt, We want the the, uh, the calculation in volts so I can compare it with the maximum allowed. So we need to divide it by a thousand. So what I need to do then is I need to find out what my millivolts per amp per meter value is for my 16 mil twin and earth cable that I've selected previously. So I'm going to go back into uh, table 4D5 of the regs or table F6 of the on-site guide. And this time I'm going to look in column nine, which is right on the end of the table to find out what my millivolts per amp per meter value is for my 16 mil um, twin and earth cable that I selected earlier. So I'm going to go down on the left cross sectional area all the way to the bottom 16 mil across the bottom, all the way to the right, to column eight, and it gives me a millivolts per amp value of 2.8. So for every meter of 16 mil to an earth cable, I'm gonna lose 2.8 millivolts. So 2.8 millivolts is the value that I'm gonna put in the formula. I know my design current, because I calculated that right at the start, which was 45.65 amps. My length, we know from our spec, is 78 meters. So I pump that into my calculator. I divide that answer by 1,000 because I don't want it in millivolts. I want it back into volts. So my actual calculated volt drop then is 3.3 volts, which I don't expect. Even though it's such a long circuit, the conductors are so big that obviously it outweighs the length and our volt drop is pretty good. So this is the opposite, opposite of the example last week when we had that small one mil cable. So it's another yeah. good example to show the difference. That's it. So we know that in the regs book, table 4AB, um, it gives us a table to determine what the maximum volt drop is, okay? So when we've got a supply from the public supply network, the DNO, which is what this um, scenario is, then we're allowed a maximum of 3% of our nominal voltage, and it tells us our nominal UO is 230 volts, or 5% on anything other than lighting, so power. So in this case, we're allowed a maximum of 5%. So 5% of 230 is 11.5 volts. So we've got a calculated volt drop of 3.3. It's got to be less than 11.5, which it is. So the cable is good for current carrying capacity, and it's also good for volt drop. So we're happy with that. So 16 mil is good to go. Happy days. Excellent. But I, don't to, I don't want to order it just yet, that <laughs> 78 meter drum. Um, the whole Sally's isn't going to be rubbing his hands just yet. Because then there's a couple of other considerations that I've got to consider to make sure that this circuit fully complies with all the requirements of the regs. So the next stage, and we didn't get this far last week, but we might as well go for it this week, is to work out whether or not that this circuit is going to disconnect under fault conditions. So shock protection. The first thing I need to do is to figure out or determine what the maximum disconnection time allowed for, uh, allowed is for this circuit. So when we go into chapter 41 of the regs, we generally are going to choose um, a protective measure to protect us against electric shock. The most common one is, of course, automatic disconnection of supply. But in some installations, you may have a combination of different protective measures. So for this uh, example, we're going to be using ADS. So all the information regarding automatic disconnection of supply, we're going to find in Chapter 41 of the regs. So when we look in uh, the regs on page 64 and 65, and we're talking about ADS, it talks um, about uh, maximum disconnection times for circuits. When we look at regulation 411.3.2.3, it talks about a maximum disconnection time stated in table 41.1 shall be applied to final circuits for the rated current not exceeding. So we've got two options to use table 41.1. Does our circuit supply one or more socket outlets up to 63 amps? No. Does our circuit supply a piece of fixed current using equipment up to 32 amps? No. 
because our circuit is supplying a piece of equipment that's above 32 amps, 50 amps. So therefore, can't use table 41.1. So when I look under table 41.1, it then talks about in a TNCS system, and that is our routing system for this example, a disconnection time not exceeding five seconds is permitted for a distribution circuit. This isn't a distribution circuit, this is a final circuit, and or for a circuit not covered by 411.3.2.2. So our circuit isn't covered by the previous regulation. Therefore, our maximum disconnection time for this circuit is five seconds. So I've got to make sure that our RCBO, our circuit breaker side of that RCBO, will disconnect in a maximum of five seconds. Happy days. So how do I do that? That's the next thing to consider. And that bit takes us on to the next page, which is this one. There we go. So the first thing I need to do then is to consider what my maximum earth fault loop impedance value is to achieve that five second maximum disconnection time for my protective device. So what I need to consider now then is to find this value of ZS and compare it with the maximum value, okay? So in order to calculate our value of ZS for this circuit, I can use the formula that's given to me in the on-site guide on page 217. So maximum value of earth fault loop impedance ZS, to calculate that, you need to know your value of ZA and you need to add that into your value for R1 plus R2. So your resistance of your line conductor and your CP circuit. So what do I know? Well, I know my ZE value because that was given to me in the spec. So I can keep that to one side. What I now need to do is calculate the value of my R1 plus R2. So I need to know the sizes of my line conductor and my CPC. So in a 16 mil uh, flat twin and earth cable, um, the line conductor is 16 mil and the CPC is six mil. Doesn't actually tell us that at the moment in um, the on-site guide or the regs, but it is coming in amendment three, a little caveat for you. They are oh, adding nice. that information, nice. which is important because some people automatically think that, oh, 16 mil, it's gotta be a 10 mil CPC. It's not. It's six mil. So you might be thinking, well, that, that can't be right. How can it be smaller? That's, that's quite small. But this, the whole point of this is in a minute is to find out if it is going to be big enough. So I'm going to base my line conductor on 16 mil and my CPC on six mil. What I need to do now is obtain my milliohm per meter value for, for the combination of 16 mil and six mil. So if I go to my on-site guide and I look at table I1, you can only find this information in the on-site guide or guide to note three. So table I1 is on page 218, nice and simple table to look at. I'm going down into my table and I'm looking for my line conductor, 16 mil, and across there for my CPC, six mil. So 16, six, that gives me a value of 4.23 milliohms per metre. So for every metre, of my 16 mil twin and earth with a six mil CPC, it's gonna have a resistance value of 4.23 uh, milliohms. So the values are in milliohms. So consequently, my formula to calculate my R1, R2 is my milliohms per meter value. I'm gonna times that by a temperature multiplier because as soon as the cable heats up, it's gonna increase resistance. So as soon as I switch the shower on, the resistance of the conductor is gonna go up. I need to allow for that. Plus I've got to think about the length of the cable, because we know from our science and principles days, um, resistance is proportional to length. I need to divide all of that by a thousand because I don't want the value in milliohms, I want it in ohms. So we get our milliohms per meter value from table I1, and we know that that's 4.23. Gonna times that by my uh, temperature multiplier value. And I get that value from table uh, I3, which is on page 220. So when I look at this table, You've got to consider how the cables, uh, the conductors, sorry, have been installed. Are they not incorporated in the cable and not bunched? Well, they are incorporated in the cable because the CPC runs between the neutral and the line conductor. And what are the, is the conductor insulation? Well, we know it's a 70 degree thermoplastic uh, insulation. So therefore my correction factor for temperature is 1.2. So I've got 4.23 times it by my multiplier value, my temperature value 1.2, and my length is 78 meters. I divide all of that by a thousand, and it gives me a value of 0 0.3959 ohms, because it's so close, we'll round that up 
So we've got an R1, R2 value of 0 0.40 volts. Happy days. So to calculate my ZS value, I need to add that to my ZE value. And we know our external earth fault loop impedance value was given to us as 0 0.14 ohms. So our total earth fault loop impedance for this circuit will be 0 0.54 ohms. Happy days. So how do I know that that amount of impedance is going to cause um, enough fault current to be enough to disconnect our device under earth fault conditions? So what I can do now is go back again into the on-site guide and look at table, uh, where is it? Uh, 41.3 in the regs and it was table, I've even lost myself now. <laughs> um, B6, wasn't it? Table B6 in the on-site guide on page 145. And also, no, I can't use table one. I've actually, yeah, that's why it's not in there. I can't use the values in the on-site guide because they've been adjusted for temperature. But I've got to use the tables in the regs because they're designed to be at the maximum operating temperature of the cable, which is 70 degrees, hence why it's not there. So look in the regs, table 41.3, and I'm looking for my maximum ZS value for my 50 amp type B 61009-1 ICDO. So when I look in that table, it gives me a maximum value of earth fault loop impedance of 0.87 ohms. So as long as my calculated value is less than the maximum value, then my circuit is going to comply that. Um, device will disconnect within five seconds, but we need to verify that. So our calculated value of ZS is less than the maximum allowed, therefore it's acceptable. So based on that value of ZS, I need to consider the actual fault current that's going to be generated at that point. So I can go back into the on-site guide again. Appendix I on page 217 in the on-site guide, and that gives us a nice bit of information formula on how to calculate our design current, but it's nice and simple, Ohm's law. So it tells us to calculate fault current under Appendix I. Our fault current is UO, which is our nominal voltage divided by ZS. So our nominal voltage 230 volts, we're going to divide that by our value of ZS, and that gives us a fault current of 425 amps, or 426 really, 425.92 uh, amps. So it's a lot of current that's going to be generated at that time. A lot of juice there. A lot of juice. So what I need to do then is confirm that the disconnection time of five seconds is going to be achieved. So what I can do is I can go into appendix three in the regs book, one of my favorite appendices, because it lists in there or gives us some time current graphs. So I can look at all my different devices from fuses to circuit breakers to ICBOs with our different types. And I've got to select the right uh, figure, the right drawing diagram for the protected device we're using. So if we go into appendix three, we're looking at figure 3A4, on page 417 in the regs book. Within that graph, there is a box on the right-hand side, okay? So within the box on the right-hand side, what it does is it tells us the amount of current that's gonna be required to disconnect all the different ratings of devices between 0.1 of a second to five seconds. So that's the minimum amount of current. So for a 50 amp device, we need at least 250 amps of fault current to disconnect that device between 0.1 second to five seconds. In other words, that amount of current will cause instantaneous disconnection. So because I've got 425 amps, I've smashed my five second disconnection time, that's gonna disconnect instantly. So I'd rather be hanging onto something that's gonna disconnect instantly than hanging onto something for up to five seconds. So, Again, we've complied with this shot protection part because we know that that device is going to disconnect super quick. So 0 0.1 seconds based on the resistance or impedance of the cable based on the length and the conductor size, et cetera. So happy with that. So my shot protection box, I've ticked that. I'm happy with that. So that's Next. Yeah, we're good with leading, that. Leading us on to the final final, the final little bit. I also need to, what we, uh, what we do now is to check our thermal constraint. So in other words, what we're going to make sure now is that that CPC that's built into our cable, which we know is six millimetres squared, under fault conditions, when we've got this 425 amps for this amount of time, 
is not going to disintegrate that CPC and it's not going to do its job. It's not going to fall apart and it's not going to get rid of the full current and whatever it is, is going to stay live. So what we've got to make sure then is that the cross section area of our CPC within our cable, six mil, is going to be able to cope with that amount of current for that amount of time. But we've also got to consider um, what we call the K factor, which takes into account the, the uh, material of the conductor being copper and the thermal resistivity of it and other um, areas that we need to consider. So in the regs, page 199, it gives us uh, a formula to be able to calculate the minimum size of the CPC required. There is another way I could do it, and I could just um, use half the size of the line conductor, again, using another part of chapter 54 of the regs. But of course, this CPC is, is already built in to this cable. So I've got six mil, that's all I've got. So it gives me a formula and it says to calculate the size, I need to square root my uh, calculated current that I've already calculated previously, my fault current. Um, I need to square that, times it by the time, and that's the time that it's gonna take for the device to disconnect. We know both of those bits of information. And I need to get my K value for the type of conductor that is built into the cable of the CPC. There is a bit of information, again, in appendix I, in the on-site guide, page 217. And it tells us um, about this adiabatic equation, um, again, to calculate the minimum size. So what do I know? So I know the current, 425.92, and I know the time that the device is going to take to disconnect based on that current. What I don't know is my K value. So you'll find K values all in chapter 54, and you've got to pick the right table depending upon how the CPC has been run. So let's have a bit of a look at that. Again, it's all about picking the right table, but you, you've got to use the right I've table. Got one. I've got that. I've got that slide. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when we look in here, we've got various tables, 54.2, 54.3, 54.4, 54.5, etc. Et so it may be in a couple of in a, in a couple of um, podcast time if there's call for it and people are enjoying some of this cable calc stuff, that we'll have some different scenarios where we've got to think about maybe we're using the, the, the containment as the CPC or maybe the armoring of an SWA or something like that, um, where you'd use the other tables. But for this one, we're thinking about values of K for the protective conductor where it's incorporated in a cable or bunched with cables, where we assumed the initial temperature is 70 degrees or greater. So for this one, we're going to be using table 54 Dot three, because our CPC, of course, is incorporated in the cable. Next thing we need to consider is what the material of the conductor is. So the CPC that's in it, is it aluminium or copper? And the insulation material that's covering it. So it's a 70 degree thermoplastic cable and it's copper. So I've either got to use 115 or 103. But 103, there's a little asterisk next to it. And that factor is for where the conductors are above 300 mil squared. We haven't got that far yet, but you never know, we might end up warring it in 300 mil soon. <laughs> it gets long so, enough. <laughs> yeah. So the K value we're gonna use then is 115. Nice and simple. So what we've got to do is just put that information into the formula. So our fault current was 425.92 amps. We know that the disconnection time from appendix three was 0 0.1 seconds and our K value is 115. So carefully put this into the calculator because you want to square root the whole top line. So when you pop it in the calculator, it comes up with a size of 1.17 millimeters squared. So that is the minimum size of CPC we're going to need to cope with that amount of fault current for that amount of time based on that conductor being copper and how it's installed. We've already got a six mil squared CPC within our cable. So of course it's greater than 1.17 mil. So it's more than acceptable and compliant with the regs. Happy days. So it's always story, always yeah. surprising with that calculation. I think it is. the, the it size is. is always so small. <laughs> it is. Um, so in summary, our chosen cable of 16 mil squared then will comply fully with all the relevant parts of 7671. But there's a picture of a big wadgy cash there. <laughs> so something to think about for everybody to think about that's listened to the podcast and got involved with it a bit. Is there a way that this circuit could be designed and maybe installed differently? And would that then affect the size of cable and ultimately the cost and ease of installation, et cetera, et cetera? Because 
16 mil, even if we went along with this, the cost of the curb is going to be quite expensive. Running that through the fabric of the building, et cetera, clipping it round and trying to terminate that into a, even the, the best pull switches like the, the Crabtree 50 amp one, et cetera, you know, difficult to connect. Also in the shower, quite difficult to do. And is it really necessary? Is there another way of doing it? Well, you've got to think about, you know, what's affected the current carrying capacity of the cable so far. Can we eliminate some of those factors? Is there another way of doing it? But I'll let people maybe comment on that and see what they think. Yeah, definitely. In fact, in fact yeah. um, hang on, hang on one second. Yeah, right. So, you know, it's just a step-by-step -step process, but the most important thing with cable calcs really is to gather the information you need and lay out in an easy to read, quick um, way that you can get the information and put the information into the relevant parts and into the relevant formulas. That's all it is. A little competition for anyone who has listened this far. Kevin from Shavin Arneur has sent me 10 of these in, or he brought 10 in actually. So these little multimeter um, devices. If you I can guess. give us some suggestions on ways to adjust the layout of this um, cable and equipment maybe, um, we'll pick 10 people who will give us some comments on the YouTube video or any social media platforms. Fabulous. And you can get yourself one of those. We'll get them popped out in the post. If you can uh, improve on the design of this circuit to maybe reduce the size of the cable, we're not going to give you any tips or clues. I can think of a few. I can think of a few options. So get them in there. And um, if you're one of the lucky people, if 10 of you even bother to listen this far, you get yourself <laughs> a nice little multimeter. But of course, we can't change the shower because uh, poor old Mrs. Smith has already bought it. No, no change in the shower. Can't That's change, not the, can't change if anyone the messages in, I'm going to put no. it on the combi boiler. You can't change that, the, the that location of the bathroom because the bathroom's right at the back of the house on the top floor. So the cable run can't really be any less than 78 minutes. It is a long run because it is an old Victorian house. So can't really consider those. But is there something else we could consider? And we've already spoke about, you know, allowing for the fact that the uh, shower is never going to overload. So we used the variation of the formula, which decreased the amount of current the cable needs to carry. But, you know, even with that 16 mil, we're kind of right on the edge there with 57 amps. But will be interesting to see what other people say and see if they've got a few ideas, really more so for apprentices and learners that may be doing yeah. the hotel project if they're doing the 5357 City and Guilds uh, framework, you know, that project in that, or even the 2365 or the EAL version. They're all the same. A cable calc is a cable calc. You just need to get all the relevant information that's in the question. And then if you've got to consult manufacturer's instructions, et cetera, information, do a survey, obviously, before you go and just throw the cable in or select the cable, find out the earthing system, the, you know, the existing consumer unit, uh, your ZA value, et cetera, et cetera. Quite a lot of considerations to make. There's probably other considerations as well that we haven't gone too deep into. But again, it's only the second one and we've expanded upon getting as far as vault drop and next time we can exactly. uh, do something else. We're trying to take people on this journey with us rather than scare everyone off at the start because designing circuits when you are stepping out into industry and even seasoned people, you know, this is good for me to brush up on. I'll be honest. There's um, bits of calculations in here that I've enjoyed going through. And it's nice to lay out. It shows that you can't just simply pull a circuit breaker out the reg books, go to your rule of thumb and yeah. think everything's going to play out nice because yeah. that's not always the way it works, is it? No. And I'll drop, really as, we, I, as I said, I'll, I'll create a website page for this. I'll put the giveaway details into that as well. And brilliant. we'll put all of the PDF on there for you to go and read through. Um, and I did also hold up the pages of the regs through the podcast that I hadn't uploaded into the file sharing thing I've got. So for anyone who wants to pause the videos, you can see that there or check your own books. It is all referenced in yeah. the sheet that Craig, um, Richard's put together for us. So everything is in there. And as I say, if you get your comments in, I'll um, put a little email link as well, however you want to do it. If you're not on social media, I'll make an opportunity for you to get that info into us. We'll have a little chat and pick 10 of you for one of the Shavin Arno. It is a, a DDTVAT, they call it. Oh, sorry, the CA740N. Brilliant. That looks really nice bit of kit, mate. Can't argue with that. It's very kind of them. Yeah, there's a couple of probes in there as well and stuff as well. So it's full-on kit, even as the batteries. So we'll get you set up with one of those, 10 of them for the lucky people who are um, uh, coming up with some suggestions. I really enjoyed that, Richard. I think that was a great, run, great, great run-through. Um, you've done a sterling job there. If you've got more a... time next time, I'll, I'll 
cut and paste the various tables and, and slot them into the PDF so it makes a bit more sense. But it's quite busy today, so I just thought I'll throw that together and it should, you know, it gives them a bit of an appetite and they want to explore areas or if there's certain parts that we want to go back over in a, in, in a future podcast, we can do that. But I don't know whether it's worth pumping it into your super software and see what your software comes up with. You mean, um, yeah, you mean, you mean the um, AI software? Yeah, no, your yeah. cable calc software. Okay, yeah, electrical yeah. OM. Yeah, we could yeah. do. Actually, Spencer is going to come on a podcast with us, yeah. so he he can do that. Yeah, that'd we'll, be lead, we'll, we'll lead up to that later on. So we're going to get Spencer back in um, towards the end of this series, where he's going to show how software can really help us skip a lot of the manual labor in doing these calculations. And Kevin, as well from Shavinano, is going to come in and have a little yeah. chat too around um, power quality and harmonics when we get to the more difficult areas of some of these calculations because i know craig's chomping at the bit to answer <laughs> that but we'll let someone else take his thunder i think <laughs> so. yeah 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 i mean it's something that's interested me over time as well but not had uh, much dealings with but it always makes you wonder i mean you must have been to loads of call out jobs where the neutral has burnt out but it's always the neutral so you can't tell me that electricians not purposely just not tightening neutrals up so there's more to it than meets the eye. That's the old wives' tale, isn't it? Or whatever mm. the PC terminology of that phrase is now, where electricians don't value yeah. the, the neutral and aren't tightening it up enough. Mm. That's nonsense. <laughs> tell, that's what I'm saying. So there's, there's, there's something else that's having a factor, a bit like our correction factors we spoke about tonight. Harmonics has the same type of effect in a roundabout way. So I'm looking forward to, to exploring that and improving my knowledge on that from the people that know. So I'm looking forward to that. To that one but hopefully that you know everyone's found that um interesting and it's it's no matter what what the calculation is you know it's the same process if you follow a nice simple process it's quite simple and i've got a step-by-step -step guide process i'll forward you that mark as a pdf and then if anyone wants to use that if it helps them and it just tells them what to think about um when they're putting a couple cup together and it reminds them to reference everything because if you're a student or a learner, an apprentice, and you hand it in for marking, your assessor then, your tutor, lecturer can see then where you've gone for the information. Because if you use the wrong table, use the wrong column, you still might get some marks because you've followed the process. All right, you might have come to the wrong size cable, but you know the process and you know how to, to use the books. So it does help. And I used to use it a lot with, uh, with my learners, step-by-step -step guide, bits and pieces like that. It just helps. So I can forward you that if that helps as well. It uh, will help immensely. That'd be brilliant. I'll definitely um, share that along. And I know we've got various people listening to these podcasts. I say these, this is the second one, but we've had questions from people who are doing kind of the design course at level four, apprentices at level two. So we've got a, a range of people. The yeah. feedback's been really positive. There seems to be a fair bit of interest in it. So we'll keep these going. We're going to come back with some more scenarios. If you do have anything in particular you want us to cover, chuck them at us. I think Craig is going to put a scenario forward on the next one and um rich still be working on more of these as well because they're the experts on this if it was left to me it would be an absolute disaster so i'm really grateful for you two stepping up and and doing it's, this um, every day is a learning day mate. every day is a learning day isn't it you know it, there's probably mistakes in that i don't know i've just followed my process and worked through it in a logical way and using tables and bits and pieces and you know we know the regs isn't that easy to follow you read a table and there's a little caveat underneath and we can talk next time about you know, the way that our circuit group with another circuit, but can we ignore that circuit? Maybe, I don't know. I'm not, I don't want to give too much away because we're going to wait for the people to come back with, you know, some reasonable solutions to, to that. Grouping problem. is definitely going to play more of a factor in the future and containment as CPCs as well, without any question. I'm looking forward to getting into it more, but thank you again for giving no up your time this evening, Richard. If anyone no does have any questions around this, please do drop them in the comments below. It'll be out on... Twitter, YouTube, and all the audio platforms. And as I say, there'll be a, a link in the description wherever you're watching this to go off to the Apprentice One to One website, find all of the files, and enter the, the giveaway. Thank you all for bearing with us listening to it. And we will see you on the next one. Cheers, guys. Take it easy.